Let's talk about the logarithm. The logarithm is one of the most intimidating and sophisticated and very simple functions that you will ever, ever run across. Um, we need to define the logarithm for complex values now. Um, the logarithm is going to obey all kinds of rules, but the most important rule that the logarithm has to satisfy is it has to be an inverse function for the exponential function. So let's think about what that means. If we're trying to define a logarithm function, then uh, basically we're trying to solve an equation like this, z equals e to the w, we're trying to solve that equation for w. If we take logs of both sides, w equals log z, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to solve that equation for w. Now here, e to the w is, well, the, the exponential function that we've defined before, this huge power series. Um, how are we going to solve this, this equation for w? Well, um, we're going to use Euler's formula to our advantage here. Um, let's say uh, that W is going to be of the form a plus bi, and then z will be e to the a plus bi. Now, we have a sum law for uh, exponentials, and that is that this should be e to the a times e to the bi. We also have a, uh, a formula, Euler's formula, for e to the bi. And so z will be equal to e to the a times um, cosine of b plus i sine of b. Now, that doesn't seem to help very much. We're trying to figure out what the value of a should be and what the value of b should be. Um, but notice here that there is actually something going on here. This thing is going to be real and positive. Why? Well, lots of reasons. Um, a is a uh, is a real number, right? Because it's the it's the real part of this complex number w. So a is a real number. So this is e to the real, and so that's always a real positive number. And if you you know, so we can use our former knowledge of e to the x to do that. Uh, we know that that our function e to the x that we've understood so far is equal to the function e to the z, at least for real inputs. And so um, that, that knowledge applies. Um, if you don't believe that, then just look at the power series, right? You, well, um, you, you plug in a real number, and then it's obviously going to be real. And trust me, it's positive. So um, one way or another, this is going to be a positive real number. Um, then this number is cosine of something plus i sine of something. This has modulus 1. Why does that have modulus 1? Well, it's effectively because b is a real number here. Um, so, uh, well, so, so when, we, when we calculate this, what we're really doing, when we calculate the modulus, we can trust that cos b is going to be real. And so the real part of this is actually cos b. And the imaginary part of this is sine b. And so uh, the modulus is uh, cos squared b plus sine squared b. The reason it matters that b is real is that if b were not real, then cos b would not be real. Then we wouldn't be able to trust that cos b was definitely the modulus, well, the, the real part of this complicated combination. But they are real, and so the modulus is this, which is equal to 1. And so we have a positive real number uh, times a, a number whose modulus is 1, and that should remind you of the polar coordinates, right? Basically, this is the, the number in polar coordinates. Now, if this is if this has modulus 1 and this has modulus unknown, and z is given, and we're trying to solve for w in terms of z, then taking modulus of both sides of this equation would help us figure out the value of a. So that's what we'll do next. Take the modulus of z, so modulus of both sides will give us, this is modulus e to the a, um, times modulus, I'm just going to write it before I eliminate it, cos b plus i sine b. So we take modulus of everything, and then this becomes modulus z. This becomes e to the a, because we already have argued that it's a real positive number already. And then this becomes 1, so I don't need to write it. And now I'm going to take logs of both sides, and that's probably going to drive me crazy. So a equals natural log modulus z. So what just happened? I just said that I needed to define the logarithm, and uh, then I just took logs of both sides as if I already had a logarithm function. Well, this is a um, this is this is well. I'm, I'm assuming c is not zero here. Uh, this is therefore a positive real number, 
and this is a positive real number. And so um, I have a, a logarithm function already, namely the real logarithm function that applies to positive real numbers. And so what I really mean here when I say take logs of both sides is that I'm using the prior knowledge real, real logarithm function. Um, and so I'm taking logs of both sides in that sense. I'm taking the real logarithm function applied to both sides, the familiar from prior knowledge real logarithm function. And we get A equals the, the real logarithm applied to the modulus of z. Of course, this won't work if the modulus of z is zero, but we wouldn't expect it to work if the modulus of z is zero because then z would be zero and e to the w cannot be equal to zero. So that actually gives us a clue what a will be, right? We're trying to solve for w, and so we're trying to solve for a in terms of z uh, and b in terms of z. We seem to have found um, a, a way to solve for a. What about b? Well. Um, cos b plus i sine b is going to be the angle by which we have to adjust this to get z. So that should remind you that z in polar coordinates, z can be written r times cis of the argument of z. And this is cis of something. And so what we're really, what we're really discovering here is that it looks like b is going to be the argument of z. So if b equals the argument of z, then z will be r, or modulus of z, times cis of b, and that will work. And so therefore, we set b to be the argument of z. And now I want to caution you here that when I write arg z, I'm being deliberately slightly ambiguous. The argument of a complex number is the angle from uh, always counted positively where zero represents the positive real axis, so the angle sweeping across uh, through the complex plane. Now, typically these angles are between zero and two pi, but not always. Sometimes they're between minus pi and pi. So um, whenever we write the argument function, we assume that there is some standard set of angles, a range of 2 pi, that we say, okay, this is like the, the this is the range in which the argument applies. And so when I write R C here, um, by default, what I mean is that the range of angles into which this applies is the angles from, from 0 to 2 pi. But that's not the only policy that is possible. We could also have a different argument function that always produces angles between minus pi and pi. Uh, whatever happens, uh, whichever argument function we, we use, this should work to give us z. So let's now calculate. So, so let's summarize what we've got here. Thus, w is equal to the real logarithm applied to the modulus of z plus i times the argument of z. And now, if this is going to work, then it's supposed to be an inverse function of the, of e to the, uh, of the exponential function. So let's calculate. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate e to the power real logarithm of the modulus of z plus i r z. Um, and what will that give us? This will give us by the power by the product law for the exponential e to the real logarithm applied to the modulus of z times e to the i r z which is, this is a real number of input it into the real logarithm into the exponential function, and so that's simply going to give us modulus of z, provided that z is not zero, which it better be if this is going to be defined. Uh, and then this is e to the i r z, which is uh, cos z, no, cos r z, cos r z, uh, plus i sine z, which is the same as cis. So this is um, cis arg z. And that really will give us z, which is what we want to get. So that's basically z in polar coordinates there. So that gives us z. And that proves that the exponential function and the logarithm function are um, inverse functions at least in this direction. Now, I, so I calculated 
e to the log z, well, e to the, the this thing, so this is what we will define to be log z now. Um, I calculated e to the log z, and I got z. If I calculate the log of e to the z, then different things may happen, and we'll have to be cautious about that. So um, let me, for the record, define um, the, na the, the natural log in the complex sense of z is defined to be the real natural log of the modulus of z plus i times the argument of z. And now again, just as there are contextual redefinitions of the argument that force it to take different ranges of values from minus pi to pi or from zero to two pi or some other weird choice, just as there are contextual redefinitions of the argument, there are corresponding contextual redefinitions of the logarithm, uh, which, which force it to take an imaginary part between some other values. So the imaginary part of the logarithm can be forced into the range 0 to 2 pi, including 0 and excluding 2 pi. It can also be forced into the range minus pi to pi, including one of those and excluding the other one. Um, so the, 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 the subtleties about the argument function affect the subtleties about the logarithm function, and you can have multiple and slightly different logarithm functions as a consequence of that. Does it matter? Yeah, it actually matters a whole lot. It matters um, about where the logarithm function is discontinuous. So the logarithm function, um, log z is continuous if and only if arg z is continuous. Because this is a continuous, well, uh, so it's not going to be continuous at 0 because it's not defined at 0, of course. But it's going to be continuous if and only if arg z is continuous. Um, why is this? Because its imaginary part is arg z, and so if this has a discontinuity, then it will produce a discontinuity for the logarithm. So where is the argument discontinuous? Well, it depends which argument you use. If we use the standard argument function, then that's discontinuous on the positive real axis. But if we use the one that takes values between minus pi and pi, that's discontinuous on the negative real axis. And so the different definitions of the argument, which affect different definitions of the logarithm, give us slightly different sets on which the logarithm is continuous. We can't have a logarithm that behaves this way and is continuous on the entire complex plane, or even continuous everywhere except zero. Um, it just won't work. So we, we always end up with a problem. Now, you can move the problem around. It can be the positive reals. It can be on the negative reals. If you shift the, the argument function appropriately, the, the problem, the discontinuities can be on the negative imaginary axis, for example. Um, but you'll always have some region on which the logarithm is going to be discontinuous. And why does that matter? Well, that matters because then it won't be a proper inverse function, um, right? If, if, it's, if it's going to have these discontinuities, it, those will be places where we get some surprises with its behavior. Um, what about the derivative of the logarithm function? Well, um, if we remember our formula for the derivative of an inverse function, if we have a right inverse function, which is what we have here, right? e to the log z is z, so log is the right inverse function, and e to the z is the left inverse function. If we have a right inverse function like this, then we can calculate its derivative like this, but only where we know it to be derivative, to be different, uh, continuous. If, if the thing is not continuous, then we cannot calculate its derivative by means of that inverse function log. And so as I warned, the, the logarithm function is discontinuous at some very important places, depending exactly on the, the discontinuities of the argument function. So, um, so let's calculate the derivative of the logarithm function, and hopefully we'll get the right thing. So um, let's write out what we know. So e to the logarithm of z is equal to z for all z in the complex plane except at 0, where that sentence wouldn't make any sense. And so the derivative with respect to z of log z is 1 over, um, what is the f prime here? The, the, for consistency with this notation, the g, which is the, the right inverse function, is the logarithm function. The f is the exponential function. The f prime is the derivative of the exponential function, which is, once again, the exponential function. And so I'm going to write e to the power here, and then here we get logarithm of z. And so the derivative of the logarithm is 1 over e to the logarithm of z. 
but we've already established that one over that, that e to the log z is z, and so that's one over z. And so the derivative of the logarithm function is one over z, and that's great. Now notice that one over z is defined and continuous and infinitely differentiable for every complex number other than zero. Um, so if you look at the domain of one over z, right, it's got a hole here for obvious reasons. And then everything is fine. It's discontinuous. It's, it's, it's continuous everywhere. It's differentiable everywhere, no problem. But that's not true of the logarithm. The logarithm has a deeper problem because the logarithm is discontinuous everywhere where the argument function is discontinuous. So here I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take the argument function to take values within uh, minus pi to pi so that it will be discontinuous here. And so basically I'm sort of trying to eliminate zero and also the negative real axis here. So here I'm saying the argument function is taking values between minus pi and pi. And then this is where, this is, this is log z, right, apparently. So this is where the natural logarithm of z is differentiable. And the derivative, log prime of z is 1 over z. On this domain, with the exclusion of the real line, the function is not, the function logarithm is not even continuous along these, um, along these negative real values. And so that's a little bit surprising. It looks like it can easily be equal to, its derivative could be 1 over z, and it looks like it has the opportunity for that to be the derivative everywhere, but that's not going to work. That's not the case. Um, so it's not differentiable here. There's a there's a jump discontinuity um, along those real along that negative real axis. So uh, this is kind of funny. Um, in the in the real case, when we learn calculus, we learn that you cannot take the logarithm of a negative number. You cannot take the logarithm of a zero, but you can take the logarithm of the positive real numbers. Uh, if we make this choice about the argument. Um, then now that we're in the complex situation, you can take the logarithm of the positive numbers. You can take the logarithm of the negative numbers. You can take the logarithm of imaginary numbers or any kind of mixed complex number, so long as, you, you're, so long as it's not zero. When you take the logarithm of the negative real numbers, fine, no problem. You get an answer. Uh, it's not continuous at those values. So um, nearby values um, will have substantially different logarithms, nearby complex values will have substantially different logarithms. So um, moreover, when you take the logarithm of a negative real number, in this sense, you don't get a real number. So this doesn't, this, this won't repair calc one. This won't, you can't take, you can't revisit the real theory and say, oh, I've, I've used my complex function logarithm to fix what's missing in the real theory. You still can't take in the real sense, the logarithm of a complex number, uh, sorry, the logarithm of a negative real number, and the reason for that is that, you know, when you take the logarithm here, um, the argument is pi. And so you get an i pi here. So you get a logarithm and you get a real part, but then you get a plus i pi. And nobody wants that in the real theory in calc 1. So this doesn't, this, this can't just reflect back on calc 1 and fix the problem original with the real logarithm. Um, however, we do get a logarithm defined at every complex number other than 0. And only discontinuous here, but still defined here. Um, why is it discontinuous? Well, because the argument changes dramatically. So um, I want to describe exactly what's happening with this discontinuity because it's really important, especially when we start integrating things, um, to understand what's happening with the jump discontinuity of the logarithm. So imagine that you're a bug walking along this graph. Let's see. So we have, we have the, the graph of log z. And imagine we're walking along this way, okay? Now, if we're really walking in a roughly circular arc, then the modulus is not changing. So as we go along this way, so the story that we're going to see is the logarithm has a nearly constant real part, and the imaginary part is slowly increasing. So gradually increasing, and it's approaching pi, right? 
So if we are a bug walking along, let me make this slightly more accurately a circular arc here. If we're walking along this circular arc and measuring the value of the logarithm as we go, then you know we're getting, I don't know what the modulus of z is, but we're getting modulus of z for the real part here, or the log of the modulus of z rather, for the real part of the logarithm. So the, that's nearly constant real part. But the, R, the imaginary part of the logarithm is i arc z, and i arc z is getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the imaginary sense, and is approaching um, i pi, right? So, so the imaginary part is, is approaching pi. And when we get here and pause for a little breather, then imaginary part of the logarithm of z is then briefly equal to pi. Because pi, it, when we're on the negative real axis, then the argument is pi, not minus pi. And then we take one more small step in this direction, and everything changes. So now that we are slightly in the, in the negative imaginary, in the bottom, slightly below this negative real axis, then this angle is no longer measured as nearly pi. It's no longer, it's not slightly greater than pi. It's now measured in the completely opposite sense as a large negative angle, nearly negative pi. So here, this is where a dramatic change happens. And so suddenly, log z decreases. Well, actually the imaginary part decreases, but the real part is not changing. So, so the, basically log z decreases by about 2 pi i. So the imaginary part of logarithm, so, so the logarithm of z goes from something plus uh, i pi and then suddenly goes to the same thing minus i pi approximately. It's not exactly equal to pi i pi, but it's like, a, like i times 3, or something slightly less than pi. So it goes down by 2 pi i, it, it shifts from exactly equal to i pi to almost negative i pi. And that's the discontinuity. And it doesn't actually matter how far out you are because it doesn't matter what this value is. This value is just the relatively constant value of the real logarithm of the modulus of z here. Now, so basically, We've got a jump discontinuity in the logarithm, and the size of that jump is it jumps by, by 2 pi i, from positive i pi to negative i pi. Now, if we use a different argument function, then it will jump in a different place. So if we take the argument function to be, uh, to take values between 0 and 2 pi, including 0 and excluding 2 pi, then if the same bug walks along this way, you can see that the imaginary part will be a, like positive i pi over 2 and then i pi over 4. I did that wrong. That's i pi over 2, i pi over 4, i pi over 8. And then we'll get close to an imaginary part of 0. So here, the imaginary part of the logarithm of z is going to be 0 because we've got an angle of 0 there and the argument is 0. So but then when we take one more step in this direction, then here, the imaginary part of the logarithm of z is approximately equal to minus 2 pi. So in other words, log z has now almost minus 2 pi i in it. And so again, we have this jump. And again, it's, uh, sorry, that's going to be positive 2 pi i. So again, in this direction, we have a jump, and it jumps upwards by uh, almost 2 pi i. So the, the size of the jump discontinuity is a discontinuity that the limit is off by, by 2 pi i. So one way or another, wherever we cross this weird discontinuity of the logarithm, we seem to gain or lose 2 pi i. Um, there's, a, there's a difference of 2 pi i between the limit of the function as it approaches the value and the actual value of the function at that value. And this is super important, especially when we try to use the logarithm to integrate. So imagine if you try to integrate 1 over z, and the logarithm, so you're trying to integrate 1 over z, 
and you're thinking, oh, well, the integral of 1 over z, dz, and we haven't done integration theory yet, but it's going to be like, we're going to imagine that we're going to be able to take the logarithm of z and evaluate it at a and b, and we'll get something. And this kind of, this kind of stuff only works if the logarithm really is the antiderivative, right? Which it is, except where it has these big discontinuities. And so when we try, this is, this is really rough here, but when we try to use the logarithm to integrate functions like 1 over z, then we will get errors um, coming from the, the jump discontinuities of the logarithm where the logarithm is not an antiderivative at all because, um, because of its discontinuities. And those errors will be exactly this, this 2 pi i that's coming out. And so we'll see 2 pi i is a really common value that we'll get for these intervals. So the logarithm is a, is a very powerful function and it's very important. And it has um, a, lot of these, a lot of the familiar properties that we would expect, but it has one very unfamiliar property, which is that it's not really an adequate antiderivative for one over z. It works perfectly except where it's discontinuous, but it always has a region of discontinuity, and that's something we need to be very aware of and watch out for.